Welcome, Pewter Report readers and listeners, to another edition of the Pewter Report podcast on a Victory Monday, energized by Celsius. I am John Ledyard from PewterReport.com, along with Scott Reynolds, today's storyteller, also from PewterReport.com. And Scott, it is an exciting day on the podcast because Pewter Report is the winners of the Bucks Media Bracket, which yeah. means that a Josh Freeman story of special importance will be told on today's podcast. As promised, there he is right there, Josh Freeman. That's an old Pewter Report cover from the last year that we actually published Pewter Report magazine, which was 2009. That was the post-draft issue right there. That was Freeman on the cover with Raheem Morris and Mark Dominic. Um, so we were going to have some some story time, as promised, John. But a lot to talk about on the show today. Um, we, we've got some pro days that are happening today that have some bucks significance i think with miami uh with all their pass rushers and the running backs at the university of north carolina so an awful lot to talk about john speaking of running backs uh since the last time we had a pewter report podcast um there's been some news there has been leonard back leonard Leonard! let's go the You're most back, happy the, the thing I'm most happy about is the fact that we get to continue that segment in the next season, hopefully for more positive reasons than no doubt. negative reasons. No doubt. But it'll be a fun segment to keep going. I got like probably five tweets right as it happened that said <laughs> that tagged me and said Leonard. I was loving it. It was hilarious. Yeah. So Leonard Fournette back in the fold. Also Josh Wells, the left tackle, uh swing tackle. He can play left or right, but the backup to Donovan Smith. Uh, he actually started a game for Donovan Smith against the Falcons in that big 31-point second-half comeback in the 31, I think it was 31-27 win at Atlanta mm-hmm. down the stretch. So Josh Wells, an important backup for this team coming back. We we already saw Joe Haig depart for, for Pittsburgh, John. So um, maybe he'll drop some touchdown passes for the Steelers this year. But Joe, uh, Joe <laughs> did you really have to say that? My gosh, it's just a sweet Monday. Like it's beautiful, it's and you're just out here choosing violence. My goodness. So Josh Wells returns along with Leonard Fournette. So we've got that to talk about. Uh, plus, we've got um, the pro days to talk about and this Josh Freeman story. But you know, John, uh, first of all, uh, we've got to pay a little uh, little love to our friends here at Celsius. What do you think? So, John, our, our good friends at Celsius uh, giving me this this awesome Celsius shirt, which I'm repping today, and some Ooh. great product. See, you're crushing the blueberry pomegranate today. I am. I am. Very I'm proud of it. Orange sickle heat and uh, getting ready to do my workout right after the show. I uh, crushed a couple of Celsius over the weekend, and uh, I worked out uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, mixing up between leg day, cardio, arms, all that stuff. So, um Hitting the workouts three days in a row, and boy, on a Monday, I need my Celsius. So if you want to find out how to get Celsius and become a Celsius customer, well, the best way to do it is click on pewterreport.com's Celsius banners. They're going to take you to Amazon where you can buy them in bulk, save a lot of money. They'll ship them right to your house. You can do the subscribe and save for even more money. If you want to just try a can and maybe try a different flavor, they got a bunch of flavors, but you're not sure which one you want to like uh, and, and bef- before you commit to buying a whole bunch of them, I get that. Go to Celsius.com, click on the store locator, type in your address. All of a sudden, you're going to see you know, Walmarts, Targets, grocery stores, convenience stores, health and fitness uh, stores pop up, and uh, you can find out where to get the, the Celsius uh, flavors near you. So check out Celsius. Highly recommend uh, the, the beverage of choice here at the Reynolds household for working out. So David wants to know, can we explain the Leonard inside joke? <laughs> That's funny. It reminds me of the office when Michael Scott goes, love inside jokes. Right. Love to be a part of someone one someday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, David, yes, to let you in on the inside <laughs> joke, just so you're aware. Um, so in the season, what we would do every Wednesday is we'd have a couple of Leonard clips queued up. And this started about, I don't know, a quarter of the 
halfway into the year maybe. And usually they would be things that Leonard did, like screw ups that Leonard did, like obvious hole when he missed it and he ran into his own guy and drop a pass, you know, things like that. Um, right. And we would just be like, Leonard, what are you doing, Leonard? And so that's kind of the inside. That's the genesis of the Leonard thing. And then we would do that. And it became like a weekly thing. Then he started doing good things. And it became right. a positive spun segment there for a little bit. So that's the gist of the Leonard signing. But like you said, Scott, there'll be other other bucks that right now that are more low-key bucks. They're, they've officially brought back all 22 starters from right. what I've read. I'm not sure how Antonio Brown is not. Maybe literally the first snap of the game he wasn't on the field. Yeah. Clearly, he was a starter at the end of the year. I mean, they're playing three wide receiver sets the majority of the time. And so I don't know. But anyway, long the biggest takeaway is that most of the key people are back from last season. Obviously, yeah. now that that's solidified, you're just waiting on the Blaine Gabberts and the Ross. It was really Blaine Gabbert. I don't know what he's waiting for, right? Like, there's nowhere to sign, really. Like, everybody yeah, signed he, quarterbacks. I, I think he saw that that quarterback money, right, the backup quarterback money that a couple of these guys got. You know, yeah. and saw dollar signs because, I mean, I think he signed for just over a million dollars last year. And um, I think he was trying to cash in on on all of the, the nice comments that both Bruce Arians and Jason Light bestowed upon him. Um, <laughs> Backfired on him. <laughs> even made some news on the Peter Report podcast right after the Super Bowl saying, yeah, he's in the mix to succeed Tom, succeed Tom Brady. Um, OK, well. I'm just saying uh, that, that probably, you know, uh, flashed some dollar signs before Blaine Gabbard and said, OK, if you want to commit to me, let's let's step up to the plate. But um, I, I, I think true. they're they're waiting to see what the, the actual market is for Blaine Gabbard. And the fact he hasn't signed anywhere else right now tells you probably what you need to know. But. The, the big takeaway is that Blaine Gabbard, clearly a listener and supporter of the Peter Report podcast, which, of course, is I great. like the guy back. What? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I mean. Back. He hears you support him. He heard Jason Light yeah. talk about how he could be the quarterback of the future on here. I mean, sure. clearly he is an avid listener and he knows what his value is. So he's he's waiting and holding out. And we're for not that. getting any commission off any future Blaine Gabbard deals. We're just doing it just out of, out of the love for Blaine Gabbard. Unfortunately, yeah. that's true. Exactly. All right. Well, <laughs> all right. Are we ready? Is this story time? Well, you know, if 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 you kids want some 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 stories, well, I got some stories for we you. We so. do, we do. Okay, all right. Well, it is time for the Freeman story. So we're going to turn off comments now because we're 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 in serious storytelling mode. Okay, this is going to take us back to the 2013 season, the beginning of the end of the Josh Freeman era in Tampa Bay, or really was it? Well, actually, believe it or not, it started in 2012. So let's kind of set the table first. You, you see, I've got the, the Freeman cover right there, right? Um, today is March 29th, John, and the NFL draft starts one month from today. Now the Bucks, they still have not uh, taken a quarterback that was drafted by this team and signed him to a second contract yet. That, right. that's, that's crazy to imagine, but the Bucks have even drafted five quarterbacks in the first round dating back to to Doug Williams in 1977. Then you had Vinny right. Testaverde, Trent Dilfer, Josh Freeman in 2009, and then Jameis Winston in, in 2015. So with the major phase of free agency over April almost here, it's time to focus on the draft. So will the Bucks draft a quarterback to succeed Tom Brady? Mac Jones, don't think he's going to be there at 32. Kyle Trask, right. Helen Mond, Davis Mills. Well, let's go back in time and talk about one of those first round quarterbacks, shall we? Josh Freeman. We need and what that really back in happened, time music. Dee, 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 dee. There you go. <laughs> so it's finally time for me to tell the Josh Freeman story. Now, let me be clear. Like all stories, there are two sides, and this this probably has multiple sides. What you're going to hear is one side, as it was told to me by multiple Bucks sources at different levels within the organization several years ago. So I'm going off my memory here. I didn't exactly jot notes down, but this is one of those stories that stuck with me. You know, mm -hmm. Mark Cook, if he was here, he, he would back me up on this. I've tried to get in contact with Josh Freeman over the years, but the emails and texts I've sent with him haven't been returned. Uh, and Josh has pretty much disappeared from the NFL landscape. Uh, he's enjoying his retirement, I guess. So uh, having said that, I'd love to have Josh on the Peter Report podcast to share his side of the story and correct the record if anything I say happens to not be true from his point of view. So there's an open invitation to come on and and uh, and have a chat about it. But I have spoken with multiple sources about a good deal of this. I'm going to get report on on what I know now. So here we go. Here's the Josh Freeman story. Why am I telling you 
the Freeman story now, nine years after the fateful 2013 season. Well, Peter Report won uh, Nick Citro's Media Champions Tournament on Twitter, right? Now, if you probably followed us on Twitter last mm -hmm. week, you saw we were in this, this competition. Uh, make sure you give Nick a, a follow, uh, please. He's, he's a great uh, guy and, and uh, has included us in, in this media tournament for the last couple of years. We were in the championship game last year in the finals before losing to Barstool Sports and good friend Stephen Shea and the Shea Hive. They beat us soundly. And as Peter Report made our way back to the championship final again this year, we, we faced some stiff competition from Jill Beckman. She's the Bucks social media coordinator. Again, follow Jill. She's fantastic. But because we're competitors and like to win, we pulled out all the stops. Now, we didn't ask Peter Report reader Nick Carter to help us out. Uh, but instead, we decided to give the people what they want, which is the Josh Freeman story. People that have listened to the Peter Report podcast for years know Mark and I have kind of danced around this subject for years. So we decided to offer this up in exchange for some votes. And if we won, which we did, I promise we would tell the real story as we know it here today on the Peter Report podcast. So uh, here we are. The problem with Freeman's uh, problems in the 2013 season, which was his last in Tampa, that was the year of his fifth year option. They really date back to late December 2012. Uh, this was Greg Shano's first year in Tampa. The Bucks were actually six and four to start that year, if you remember. And Freeman was completing 56% of his passes with 21 touchdowns and seven interceptions at the time through 10 games. And that's pretty good. That's a three to one ratio. Not bad for a young quarterback still on his rookie deal. Then the ESPN photo shoot took place on a fateful Tuesday in December. Now, Tuesdays, are the players day off in the NFL. Unless you're a starting quarterback, then you're expected to be in the building with the coaches on your Tuesday, watching film, observing the game plan as it's being created by the coaches. The coaches then begin installing the game plans on Wednesday when the players come back to the building. Now, the quarterbacks, the reasoning to having them in there on Tuesday is to get a head start. So they're not hearing this for the first time on a Wednesday. They're hearing it for the second time on a Wednesday, okay? So if you remember, Josh Freeman struck a pose as Michael Jackson from the Thriller uh, album. And what happened? Well, Josh was a no-show at that Tuesday session at One Buccaneer Place. And he decided to instead to do a four-hour photo shoot with ESPN in Tampa to recreate that Thriller album cover. And uh, I don't recall which Tuesday he missed, but the Bucks lost five games after that six and four start, five in a row, including four straight games in the month of, of December. So if you go back and look at, at Josh Freeman in, in 2012, they started off six and four, and then you see those five straight losses, 24-23 to Atlanta, 31-23 to, uh, to Denver out there mm. at, at Mile High, 23-21 home loss to Philadelphia, a 41 to nothing shellacking at New Orleans, and then a 28 to 13 loss at St. Louis, or should say, should say to St. Louis. Then they won on the road to finish seven and nine that year, 22 to 17 against the Falcons in Atlanta. So as you can see, a one point loss at home to Atlanta, eight points to Denver, two points to New Orleans. It's all about attention to detail at the quarterback position. And two more points against Atlanta, three more points against Philly, and the Bucs are 9-7 and seven instead of 7-9 and nine in Shiano's first year. Mm -hmm. So the Bucs lost those five straight games. Now, during that five-game losing streak, you know, the bottom kind of fell out for Freeman. He, he completed 52.5% of his passes during that stretch. He only threw five touchdowns, nine interceptions, and was sacked 12 times. Now, Freeman would become the first Bucks quarterback to throw for 4,000 yards and set a franchise record with 27 touchdowns against 17 interceptions that year. Now, let me say this. I like Josh Freeman. Okay, He's a K-Stater. And, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say that I was rooting for him to get drafted, but I knew that with Raheem Morris coming from Kansas State, out there one year as the defensive coordinator during Freeman's freshman year, I knew that the Bucs had some serious interest in Freeman. We even had him on 
our pre-draft issue um, mm-hmm. forecasting that if if he were still around by the time the Bucks run the clock, that there's a good chance that he could be the pick. Um, I've always had a good relationship with Freeman as a Buccaneer, but something happened at the end of the 2012 season that really sank his professional ship and in, ended up sinking Greg Schiano's and general manager Mark Dominic, uh, the man who drafted Freeman, too. Now, there's a reason why Shiano and, and Dominic drafted Mike Glennon in the third round of the 2013 NFL draft. It wasn't just to get depth at the quarterback position. That was the reason. There was a reason behind Freeman's decline behind the scenes. If, if you remember, Peter Report actually had Mike Glennon as a Bucks best bet that year at quarterback. Did we know something was up? We sure felt it. Okay. So let's let's go to uh to the summer of 2013, shall we? Now this is a picture of my boys here. Uh Caden to the left, uh, as you're watching this picture. Logan is the, the kid in the middle, and then my my uh, uh football buddy uh Cade Zoyce, who is Logan's one of his buddies, right there. Uh all of us went to the Josh Freeman camp in the summer of 2013. Now the problem is Josh Freeman failed to show up for his own football camp. Actually, he literally <laughs> showed up with just minutes left to his own football camp. I attended the camp, and I saw his father, Ron, who was there, furiously trying to reach out to Josh on his phone. He wouldn't pick up, wondering where Josh was. As it turns out, Vincent Jackson was called into action. Action Jackson appeared to save the day. He ended up showing up an hour into the football camp as a surprise guest. He wasn't supposed to be there. But he saved the day by working with kids for the last hour of the camp. The, the camp, as the camp's literally winding down, Freeman rolls up in a yellow sports car. Can't remember if it was a Lamborghini or Ferrari, but he addressed the kids at the conclusion of the camp and took some picks. This would be a sign of things to come, folks. In a 2013 preseason, over the three games that Freeman played in, they don't play in the fourth one. That's that's for the scrubs, but. In the three games that Freeman played in, in the 2013 preseason, now remember, this is his fifth-year option. This is his contract year. Freeman completed 12 of 26 passes. That's less than 50%. For 101 yards with no TDs and no interceptions in three games combined. Okay, In the third preseason game at Miami, he was 6 of 16 for 59 yards in three quarters. Right, This is a... A, a guy who had just come off a 4,000-yard season, 27 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. Something was clearly not right with Freeman. Uh, was it the pressure of the contract year? Was it something else? Well, I don't know all of the details because that's for Freeman to to know. And if he wants to share, welcome to hear his side of it. But I'll, I'll let you in on a couple of details, which really ended up uh, affecting a lot of people in Tampa Bay. So, on September 5th, it's reported that that Freeman did not get a, a team captain. Uh, now he was the team captain under Raheem Morris. He was even the right. team captain under the first year of Shiano. But in 2013, that C comes off the chest. So Josh Freeman was, was stripped of, of his captainship. There was a, a, a vote, and he wasn't voted a captain. Now, that raised a lot of eyebrows. Did Greg Shiano do this? Did he rig the vote? That, that's something that the Freeman camp would allege later. But as it turns out, a week later on September 12th, Freeman confirmed that he slept through the team's official photo at the end of training camp. So this is the Bucks team photo. He slept through it. Now, this is not news. This, this is stuff that's been reported. I'll get to the stuff that hasn't been reported in a second. But this probably had something with him, you know, something to do with him not being a captain, right? If you don't show up mm-hmm. for the team photo in your contract year oh and by the way you were a captain and you're the quarterback right right get right. trust get with trust little, little things, things and you'll get trust, trust with big things eventually. exactly exactly so so you know in between that september 5th where you know he he was it was revealed that he was not a team captain and in between the 12th which was the um uh the, the time when he admitted to oversleeping and missing uh the you know, the, the team photo. Um, well, there was the season opener against the lowly New York Jets in New York. The Jets would face Geno Smith, a quarterback, a rookie, in the 2013 opener. 
And and that's again, this is the beginning. This is the first game of Josh Freeman's contract year. Freeman would complete 48.4% of his passes with a touchdown, an interception, and he drew two delay of game penalties and and also had a safety in which he contributed to by not paying attention to the snap from Jeremy Zuto. He ended up kicking the ball out of bounds. Uh, he would also get sacked a couple of times and just not really seem like he was with it, right? When you complete less than 50% of the passes, that's a horrible overthrow into a triple-covered uh, Vincent Jackson, right? So uh, here's the untold story about that Jets game, and this this would this would be kind of the, the nail in the coffin. Chiano had loosened up. All right. Now, this is a guy that was was toes in the line, right? He was he was a hard edge guy. He would turn the thermostat down at one bucket in your place to uh, a freezing temperature. It was like 60 degrees in that building to make sure all the players were awake for team meetings, et cetera. Uh, he, he was he was pretty militant about his approach. He, he kind of ruled the Buccaneers with a with an iron fist. And in 2013, after some of the captains had had gone to him and say, hey, you know, loosen up, he did. Um, he no longer required the Bucks players to check in for meals, okay, on a daily basis. Like when you would go to the team's uh, one buck place, you had to check in for breakfast, check in for lunch. He didn't make the players do that. Like they're like, come on, guys, th th this is not Rutgers, right? We don't, we're not kids here. We're not college kids. Sure. We're professionals. Sure. So please don't check on us. Well, the only meal that Chiano made the players check in for was the pregame meal. On game days, he just wanted to make sure that the guys were properly uh, hydrated and had their nutrition before kickoff, right? Okay, they could live with that. Not a big deal. So the quarterbacks usually take the first of three buses to the stadium with the coaches and any other players that want to go uh, to the stadium early that day. Freeman missed the first bus. Shiano, well, and guess what? He overslept, right? At least that's that's what people thought. He's over oversleeping, missing his camp. He's oversleeping, uh, missing the team photo. Did he over oversleep and miss the first bus? Well, that was what people were thinking. So Shiano called an assistant to find out if Freeman was was eating breakfast uh, and would maybe be on the second bus. But Freeman was nowhere to be found. The second bus rolled to the stadium. Now Shiano is pissed. He can't find his starting quarterback for the 2013 oh, season opener, which is the first game of Freeman's contract year. The Buck staff is still at the team hotel, and now they're panicking. This is literally a couple hours before kickoff. They call Josh's cell, no answer. They call his room, no answer. They knock on his hotel room door, no answer. Members of the staff scramble. They can't find their starting quarterback hours before the Jets game. Now, I, I, here, here's the thing. They, they got the hotel security to open the door where they found Freeman, okay? Let's say Freeman was not awake, per, <laughs> perhaps due to inebriation of some kind. <clears throat> I wasn't there, so I can't say if it was alcohol or something else, but as it was told to me, Freeman was helped up, rushed into the shower, raced downstairs onto the third and final bus, which had been waiting for him. They actually had to hold the third bus for the starting quarterback. When Freeman gets to the stadium, the Bucs have the most disastrous first series to start a season prior to Jameis Winston's pick six on his first NFL throw <laughs> two years later. Okay. If you remember, Freeman calls a timeout to avoid a delay of game penalty, then proceeds to get back to back delay of game penalties. Okay. There were some helmet issues. Okay. He couldn't hear. Uh, the problem a was very good. No, very bad. <laughs> yeah, the, the problem was was yes, there 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 was some communication issues. The the headset in his helmet went out. Okay, uh, the only problem with with that scenario though is is as it was told to me, Shiano told Freeman during the timeout. Um, well, if this happens again, just call a play. You know, an audible. Do you know what an audible is, John? Yes. An audible is where the quarterback uh, gets a play call and then decides to do something else, right? The problem was Freeman was, let's just say, not all there because of maybe what happened the night before. Sure. <laughs> maybe because of what happened before the game. <laughs> and as a result, 
he had to take two delay of game penalties because he couldn't think of a play to call. Okay, so second and 10 becomes wow. second and 15 because of a delay of game, and second and 15 becomes second and 20 because of a delay of game. Then Freeman gets sacked for a 10-yard loss. Then there's a false start by DeMar Dotson. So now it's third and 35 on the first series of the Bucks versus Jets game because Josh Freeman is kind of foggy. Then you have a two-yard pass to Doug Martin, which sets up a punt, obviously, on fourth and 33. Now, John Lynch was calling the game for Fox, and he said, Mike Sullivan, the offensive coordinator, said part of the theme is to embrace the chaos this year. Against the New York Jets defense, they've not embraced it at all. They've crumbled in the chaos in the New York Jets opener. That's that's a direct quote from, from John Lynch calling the game. Then on the next series, John, you already played that clip. Let's play it again. Yeah. There's that that safety when Freeman just wasn't looking or paying attention from that Jeremy Zutas snap. That's on third and five at the Tampa Bay eight. Great and presence of mind to kick the ball to the back of the end zone. Though. He did. At least he did that. <laughs> but that gave the Jets a two to nothing lead. And unfortunately, that interception that you see right there, the Buccaneers had actually put 14 points on the board. It was 14 to five. But that interception right before halftime helped sink the Bucs ship. So, What's crazy is that I was watching some of this game before. He actually made some throws. Like hearing yes. about the state that he was in, it's. Am- right. I mean, obviously there was no consistency. It wasn't a good game, but right. he threw a great touchdown. I forget who it was two at, the, at that point, um, but he it threw was, a great touchdown. Mike, Mike Williams, was, right? Mike, uh, yeah, yeah, that was a tight window to throw, and with some it zip. Was. Off, so I mean, keep in mind, Josh Freeman's been throwing the ball since yeah. you know Pee Wee. So I mean, he's, dude. you know, he, he can he can sling it. Um, but at the same time, completed less than 50% of the passes in that game. And that was a recurring trend. Matter of fact, at no point in time during the preseason did Freeman complete more than 50% of the passes in any game. So this is another quote from John Lynch from the broadcast after the, the safety. Uh, when you start like this, the leadership is absolutely critical from Josh, I'm sorry, from Greg Shiano, from Josh Freeman. And there has been a lot made of that. Josh Freeman, not named a captain this year, very uncharacteristic. A guy who has been called a captain in the past, not named a captain, but right now, captain or not, he needs to take hold of this team and say, fellas, bad start. Let's get going. The Jets would go on to win 18 to 17 on a last second field goal. That that safety uh, certainly did not come back to help um, his his cause right there. So so really, you know, what happened? Right. You're looking at the at the, the 2013 season. Well, you can see there that. It, Freeman's 0-3 start in 2013. That that Jets game was was truly the nail in the coffin. He got a couple more opportunities, but again, 40.9% of his passes, a touchdown interception, and, and a close loss. It really was a winnable game against New Orleans. Then you have uh, a terrible performance, uh, 46.3%, uh, 236 yards passing, an interception, and a 23-3 loss at New England. And uh, it was over before it began. Freeman wouldn't complete more than 49% of his passes in any of those starts, all of them losses. It got so bad that Vincent Jackson went to management, even above Shiano, and told them to bench Freeman and start rookie Mike Glennon. Wow. Whether that or not doesn't happen very often in the NFL either. Nope. That's crazy. He has but to get Vincent- to an ugly point for it to go like that. Yeah. But Vincent Jackson did have the C on his chest, he was a team captain. And and he was frustrated beyond belief, right? And remember, it was it was Jackson who saved Freeman at his own camp earlier right. that summer. So Vincent Jackson, the ultimate consummate professional, uh, saved the day, or at least so he thought. Whether or not Chiano agreed with that, Freeman was benched on September 25th. Lennon took over. Freeman was waived on October 3rd after the Bucks couldn't trade him. The problem was that Chiano never gave the media a heads up about Freeman's issues. He actually protected Freeman and Freeman's reputation by not talking about it, even off the record to the media, including myself. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that wound up being his downfall, uh, you know, in addition to that 0-8 start to the 2013 season, of course. So when when Shiano revealed some of the details about what was happening behind the scenes, it was too late for him. There were billboards already running around town that, um, you know, that, 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 that Freeman was um, – that Freeman debacle had had just cost him, right? That and the 0-8 start. 
So there were already billboards up around town where Shiana was was you know being called on to to get fired. Um, the local media turned on him, including us at Peter Report. I, I wrote uh, a column saying that that uh, Shiano should be fired as well. Now, I was being fed one side of the story at the time by Ron Freeman, Freeman's father, who was bad mouthing Shiano, calling him a tyrannical dictator. Shiano didn't try to counter that narrative until it was too late. And again, it, it wasn't just this, it was the 08 record, but this was a big part of it. Then, of course, Shiano gets blamed for rigging the captain vote and, and for leaking the info to the media that Freeman had entered an NFL drug campaign. Well, Freeman, who had ADHD, put out a statement saying he switched medication from Adderall to Ritalin. That's why he got flagged by the league. Freeman came out and said that he passed all 46 drug tests that were administered to him over a year and a half. Yet it was told to me by a Buck source that the, the two things that don't show up on the drug tests that are fl that will flag you are alcohol, which and that's legal if you're an adult, and painkillers, which NFL teams have been known to dish out like candy at Halloween at times. Um, so I'll let you draw your conclusions about what substance Freeman, you know, uh, I, I, I guess I'm going yeah, was it was under the influence or or uh, led to his his demise? But really, at the end of the day, Josh Freeman, you know, he ended up being his own worst enemy. The, the days before before Shiano um, was fired, he told me that he actually spent more time trying to help Freeman than he did any of his college kids at Rutgers. Oversleeping and missing his own camp, oversleeping and missing the Bucks team photo oversleeping or passed out and nearly missing the Bucks 2013 season opener. No wonder the Bucks put in alarm clock numbers on their new jerseys in 2014, people, after the Josh Freeman debacle in 2013, which was an absolute wake-up call for this franchise. So that is the untold Josh Freeman story. Wow. Uh, wow. That, that, that Jets game was – there was a lot more to, uh, to it than, than met the eye. Certainly. And again, I'd love to have Josh come on and tell his side of the story, although I, I doubt he would want to. Uh, he's kind of dodged uh, interviews talking about the end of I was going to say, I don't think I've heard anything about him in that Minnesota state, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a shame because the guy's 33 years old right now. And you see, you know, Tom Brady at 43, what he's doing. And of course, Brady is a rare, rare, um, uh, you know, now, he's the GOAT. I mean, he's the greatest of all time. But but you still see quarterbacks in their mid-30s playing, having some success. And the arm talent was there for for Josh Freeman. And, um, um, you know, watching him at Kansas State, he beat Texas, um, I think, all three years, maybe. Uh, at least back-to-back, -back, I know. But the troubling thing was he lost all three games to Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri, which were our big rivals at the time. And so it's always been about the, the neck up at the quarterback position. And for whatever reason, Josh Freeman just didn't put the time in, didn't put the the work ethic in. And and that that ultimately led to his um, you know, his his demise in Tampa as a professional athlete, um, uh, as a quarterback of this team, as a as a former number one pick. And and um, you know, the interesting thing too is is that after watching Freeman for five years, after watching Jameis Winston for five years, and I wrote about this in my SR Spat Five, John. I'm just at the point where for all of the quarterbacks that are out there and you can look at the Patrick Mahomes and, and the Lamar Jacksons, mm -hmm. most of the first round quarterbacks just don't pan out. They just don't. They're coach killers. And, and you can see what happened with Freeman. There were two coaches you know, Raheem Morris that drafted him, Greg Schiano that, that, you know, tried to salvage him. That, that both of those guys and the general manager for both of those coaches, Mark Dominic, you know, went by the wayside. And then you have Jameis Winston, who went through three head coaches. Lovey right. Smith, who drafted him. Dirk Cutter, who was the offensive coordinator and tried to take him to, to new heights. And and then Bruce Arians, the quarterback whisperer, who uh, after throwing 30 interceptions and seven pick sixes said, nah, I can't have a quarterback that's going to, you know, kill me with the takeaways, or I should say the turnovers, ends up being takeaways for the defense. So, I'm at the point now after watching Brad Johnson win a Super Bowl in 2002 as a veteran, uh, you know, Brian Greasy playing his part in 2005, uh, 
Jeff Garcia coming in and in, in, in 2007. All three of those years, veteran quarterbacks started the season for the Buccaneers. And in, in, in 2002, 2005, 2007, they won the NFC South championship and, and went to the playoffs, had home playoff games. And even though they didn't win the division this year, they had another veteran, Tom Brady, who took this team to the ultimate heights and winning the Super Bowl. You look back at what Carson Palmer did under under Bruce Arians in, um, in Arizona. And you know what, John? When, when Tom Brady ends up hanging up the cleats and retires as a Tampa Bay Buccaneer, you know, I think a 39-year-old Aaron Rodgers would look awfully good in red and pewter. So no more risk for me. Yeah, I mean, you will, You definitely will not have to tell me it is uh, even get a position after quarterback of the future. But then we put on top of it, you have to develop that guy, and that guy has to be the guy going forward for your team. And especially in the to win now, it becomes very, very difficult, very, very challenging. And I would obviously, there would be better that you could imagine. An Aaron Rodgers step type of situation, obviously, in a couple of years. So it is an interesting thing, and, and, and appreciate the Josh Freeman story and thumbs ups and that's I liked for the podcast for Scott telling the Josh Freeman story. Uh, this is some fascinating time in Bucks history, and it's crazy to see how far the franchise has come in just a short time. Really, I mean, that wasn't that long ago. That was where this franchise was at. And, they were able to get it together so quickly under Brady. I'm sure you could tell stories of the, of the Winston era and of the, the Dirk Cutter era even, but might not have been that bad, but still indicated a franchise seemed seemed like they were far away from being Super Bowl champions again, and it changed in a very short amount of time into the organization you see now. And it's just so indicative of how important it is to have those right people up top. And if you have them, things really can't get turned around in a hurry. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that the Buccaneers shouldn't draft a quarterback, but anytime you draft a quarterback in the first round, it means that you're usually a bad team. And yep. usually when you're a bad team, you have a rookie quarterback going into a bad team. It, it usually doesn't end well. Uh, right. That's not always the case, but um, I, I'm just kind of a believer in you, you find, you find the quarterback, uh, you know, off the, the scrap heap or in free agency. I mean, Brad Johnson was a free agent and they signed him in 2001 and um, we thought he was going to go to Baltimore. He ended up leaving Washington and coming to Tampa Bay. So every once in a while, you can get him. We just saw Jared Goff get traded uh, in a swap for Matt Stafford, right? Between right. the Lions and the Rams. And so I, I think after, you know, even after Goff helped the Rams get to the Super Bowl, it's kind of that defense that that, that did it. Um, but, but you know, I, I think McShay uh, – you're, you know, I'm sorry, McVeigh said, you know, hey, we've had enough of the Jared Goff experiment here, and let's get a veteran in here. We want to win and uh, and win now. So, um, you know, I I, I I I would be okay with the Bucks drafting a quarterback, just not in the first round, not not anymore. Right. Well, it's going to be interesting where they take the franchise at point in time when that point in time does indeed come, but. Do want to make sure that we are uh, not only remembering the bad moments in Bucks history, but the good moments as well. Playbook products. Uh, we've partnered with Playbook Products to, for a giveaway, a poster, uh, a set of coasters of the greatest Bucks plays to enter. All you have to do is this: you have to follow at Playbook Product on Twitter, Playbook Product, retweet. The tweet that we've got up, a pewter report, we've got a tweet up out there, uh, plug in playbook products and some of their awesome uh, Bucks memorabilia and, and they have coasters and mugs. I've got my mug right here, actually, Scott, uh, that, that uh, just came uh, Super Bowl bound. It's uh, the the Scotty Miller catch, you can see, I think, uh, this Miller catch awesome. uh, against the Packers. Yeah, right on the mug. I mean, this stuff is awesome. I mean, playbook products, like, this girl and gem. So anyway, yeah, you can enter. And then there's a there's a 10% off as well right now. You can get 10% off uh, your purchase with the code Pewter, P-E-W-T-E-R, Pewter is that code. So go to playbookproducts.com. Like I was saying, I go to that Twitter and you can enter uh, the giveaway to or enter the chance to, to win a set of codes for that giveaway of Playbook Products. But we're uh, pumped uh, that they've uh, become a sponsor of the podcast and really, really enjoy a lot of the products. Check it out over at Playbook Products. Products.com, even of another team. Good stuff there. All right, we've got pro days we want to talk about too, Scott. I mean, lots going on right now. 
not not in the pro day world. Today was a big one, right, for Bucks fans because the UNC running backs, Javante Williams and Mike Parker, both had their pro day today uh, and had the results come in, and along with the Miami edge rushers, all three of them, Jalen Phillips, Gregory Rousseau, Quincy Roche, they all had their pro day today. Uh, and uh, we got some interesting results of those pro days. I don't think there was anything too unexpected. Well, let's talk about the UNC running backs uh, first. To me, the fact that we had with Javante Williams and with Michael Carter was neither of them running a great 40, right? Right. I think Javante Williams ran 4.58, uh, Michael Carter 4.55. How much do you trust the number? I don't know. Um, but I think at this point, you can say that neither are fast. I don't think we expected that, right? That's it's right. not the end of the world for a running back prospect if you're not fast. There are plenty of running backs in the NFL right now that are not fast and are still really good players that didn't test well. They're still players. One of them plays in vision with the Bucs and Alvin Kara. Um, but it, not to me, it's not a, a overly concerning. Result. Now, if they'd run of the 4.8s or 4.9s, but at that level, to me, you know, being you know, probably four or six guys have been at the Combine – um, I don't think that it's the end of the world that they tested the way that they did. Yeah, and you look back in, two, in 2017, John, uh, the decision the Buccaneers were, were trying to make in the third round was they liked two guys. They liked Chris Godwin, the wide receiver, who they ended up selecting, and they also liked running back out of Toledo, Kareem Hunt, who ran a 4.62 at the Combine. That's that's kind of slow for a running back, but if you remember, he ended up being a Pro Bowl rookie, led the league in rushing with Kansas City, and – and, uh, you know, we turned out to be a really good running back uh, until he ran afoul of, of the law. And it kind of derailed his his career in Kansas City. But he's, you know, he's trying to restart that as a one-two punch guy with Nick Chubb in Cleveland. So Lamar Hunt is proof that it's not about speed. It's about tackle breaking ability. Can you slip tackles? Can you break tackles? And for his size at 5'8", Michael Carter can slip some tackles. And for his size right. at 5'10", 220 pounds, Javante Williams can flat out break some tackles. Right. And their testing numbers were great other than those 40. I mean, the 40s were fine, but the testing numbers were really good for those guys. I mean, Javante Williams, just for an example, uh, when you look at the rest of his numbers, a vertical jump of 36 inches, a broad of 10'3", I mean, showing that lower body explosiveness, that's way more important, that burst, the short, you know, to be able to move, have those short, that short area quickness. Those are the things that really, really matter. Even look at his shuttle. I mean, a 409 shuttle is, is a really good shuttle for a running back. Um, same with the three cones, six, nine, and three cones. It's a great time. I really don't think that that farmers are a ton for the running back position. Vision and instinct are probably the most important things. Burst, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the burst, the kind of burst that comes from you know, a, a three or four point stance like you do at the, at the combine. Um, it's mm -hmm. just a different, it doesn't always translate the, the exercises. Whereas right. the other position we'll talk about today uh, definitely translates a little bit. Yes. Rashad did miss the story. You can go back to the beginning of this podcast and hear the Freeman story. Definitely a, a really good one, but talking about Javante Williams, and Michael Carter, the UNC running backs, you know, to me, I thought they still, it's always good to have athleticism, right? It's yeah. crucial to be a great prospect at certain positions but it's always never a bad thing to have the athleticism. And so the fact that both of them test well and Carter, again, he also had, you know, again, size wise is going to be a question with Carter. You have to remember everything's weight adjusted too, but he did hit 200. I think he came in at 201 yeah. and that's it, despite being five, seven and seven eighths. Right. Um, you know, Michael, uh, um, we're going to Monte Williams was over five, five nine eight. and he was two twelve. I think we're going to round up and call him five, eight. That's right. We'll round up. We'll, we'll give Michael Carter 5'8". <laughs> I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Yeah. But the fact that they did what they did, you know, at those weights, again, Michael Carter is not quite as good of an athlete as Javante Williams, but he still put up really good agility. Scores, right. And that's Michael Carter's game, right? He needs to be agile and win in yeah. that way. And so I don't find anything overly concerning with those guys. Again, you're talking about guys that are probably not first round graded running backs, right? So yeah. there's going to be some level of limitation, right. but it doesn't mean that it's stop them from being really good players in the NFL right. and that matters too. Yeah. And, and I think the thing is, is, is uh, uh, you've had it in your most recent mock draft, John, I, you know, we put it in, in our first Peter report bucks, seven round mock draft back in February, Javante Williams going to the bucks at number 32. And, and the, the reasoning for that is if they want a running back and, 
And, and if uh, Travis Etienne from Clemson and uh, Najee Harris from Alabama, if, if they're off the board at that time, then what you have is, is you've got uh, Javante Williams, you know, there as the number three back. Um, and, and if you can't trade back, and maybe you don't want to trade back because there might be a team right there at the top of the second that wants to get one of those upper, upper echelon running backs, then the Bucks might stick and pick at 32. But that's the reasoning there. But I agree. I think Javante Williams uh, is a second round guy. Yeah. But when you're picking 32, you're literally a spot away from the second round. So, yep. Yeah, I mean, I say it every year. There are not 32 first round yes. caliber players. Doesn't mean there won't be yeah. 32 guys picked in the first round. But yes. the caliber of player that you give a first round grade to, or that a team right. would give a first round grade to, that represents something. So the caliber of player that gets a first round grade is somebody, for an example, I'm not saying it's universal, but for me, it would be like right. somebody who's an excellent starter at their position. You could give a top yeah. 10 or top five or generational grade or whatever you want to call it to like a player that, like a Trevor Lawrence or somebody like that. You believe he's like a top five type of player in any class. Right. He'd be that type of player. Then you put him in that category you know you put them in that special category then you give your first round grades to guys you think could be among the best players at their position in the league that's how i think about it a lot of teams think about it that way but there are never 32 of those guys you don't have 32 of those grades yeah so it really just depends who comes off the board and where they come you're right and a a lot of teams they'll they'll have between 12 and 20 uh, players that they have first round grades on so that that, that's really what it is it's it's that and i think the patriots now the, the buccaneers i think they only have Somewhere between 50 to 75 players uh, out of the 200 plus that are going to get drafted, they only have draftable grades on about um, about maybe four dozen players. And that really varies per year to year. depends on on the depth of the, the, the draft class, the quality of it, the quantity. Um, but uh, it's it's not like like teams draft boards are 400 players or even 200 no. players. It's not. Uh, I, right. I, I want to say Bill Belichick, there was one year he had 30 draftable yes. players. In, in right. the, and, you, and you think, how in the world is that possible? Because it's literally a handful of players in the first round and second round, third round, et cetera. And, and what, what they do is, is they, they say, okay, well, this guy is, um, he's not a good scheme fit. So, you know, he, we're just going to just take him off our boards. He doesn't fit what we're looking for from a certain measurable trait standpoint, right? Maybe just too mm-hmm. small, too undersized, whatever. Um, Maybe there's medical concerns. Maybe there's character right. concerns, right? Maybe failed drug tests, whatever. Um, so many players are literally crossed off boards. Um, and, and they're, they're put in, into undrafted free agent category, really, is what they are. And then right. some teams that have quarterbacks, it, it's it's a, they literally don't have any of the quarterbacks on their draft board if they're set at number one and number two. Now, if, if a player like Mac Jones falls to you know, the third round, yeah, that's what – that's when you you take a quarterback, even if you don't need one. But but that's not going to happen. But but that that's that's what you're saying, John. Is is uh, these teams just they have a, a, literally uh, a couple dozen draftable grades, right? For sure, exactly. It's not going to be a a, a bunch of dudes, not like hundreds of dudes, like you see these draft analysts on social media. They're like, okay, you know, we, we're putting out our top two, our top 300 big board. Well, it's, it's great. It's fine that you do it, but it's, there's not 300 guys that teams consider draftable. And so that's why when I think about prospects, people always say I'm super critical of every, and that's people said about in the season when I'm talking about Leonard and talking about, but if you're not critical, you're going to give draftable grades, second or third grades to everybody you think are all right. You have to be critical in your process. And teams know that now they can't be like, Oh, this guy's okay. No. What does he do? Does he do anything at a level that can? Does he have a trump card in the NFL that he can right. win on? Does he have traits? Does, does his character matter? Does it check out? There, all of those things really matter. That's why we use things when we say when so and so has great tape but runs a four nine, you just take him off your board because in the range yep. that somebody else will draft him, you won't. And that you have to be right. that kind of that critical, I think, in your analysis of, of how these things go. One guy that's probably off some teams' boards after these pro days, Scott is Gregory Russo, a uh, defensive prospect in this class that we talked about as a potential pick for the Bucks, but not a likely pick for yeah. the Bucks, probably. Right. We thought he'd be off the board. There's Quincy Roche, and, and he had yeah, an okay Quincy day. Qu- Quincy Roche actually out-tested Ro- Rousseau, did he not? Right. In he he did in most categories, maybe not the 40. And then there, you have to wait adjust, too, because Rousseau is 266 and Roche right. is 243, I think. But yeah. – um, Roche, obviously, 
obviously very different body types. Roche, you know, that stuff is going to be an issue. He's a smaller edge rusher, but obviously he's very stout. He's very thick edge rusher. Yeah. You know, again, I, I keep going back to Noah Spence. He really reminds me a lot of Noah Spence. They have these great bodies, right? Like they, I mean, they're very, very built, but at the same time, there's no, there's not the length. There's not the explosiveness. There's not the traits that you need really to win at that position, in my opinion. But Spence tested, I mean, uh, Spence tested okay, I guess, in some ways. But Roche tested okay today from what I saw. I don't think anything was – and you have to wait to adjust things again. He's 243, and so it makes it questionable a little bit. But Rousseau really just didn't test very well. His 40-yard dash was the best thing, and that's really not what you want as an edge rusher. It's not one of the more important things in my opinion. You have to hit thresholds there. But Rousseau, I mean, his three cone is abysmal. I mean, seven five zero. There's yeah. hardly any edge rushers that get drafted with that kind of a three cone um, that does that do really good things. And so right. it, he he continues to be one of those players that just kind of befuddles me. When you look at his jumps, I mean, this got a thirty inch vertical, Scott. Mm-hmm. Thirty inch vertical. Ryan Fitzpatrick right. jumped higher than him. Well, uh, and it's you just, know what, John? What, what did Gregory Rousseau do, do last year for the Hurricanes? Nothing. No Nothing. tape. Didn't play. <laughs> he didn't play. He opted out due to COVID. Matter of fact, Jalen Phillips came in, took his number, took yeah, his jersey number, and said, right. I'll wear that 16 and I'll make it look good. Now, 50, the thing with, 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 with Rousseau is, is what have you been doing for the past year? Okay. Yeah. I, we, now, we saw Ellerson Smith and Spencer Brown from Northern Iowa. They couldn't even play football because of COVID because they're an FCS school. Okay. Right. They came in and actually had. Uh, a pretty decent um, senior bowl, right? I mean, they, they right. kind of impress scouts to a degree, not having played football for a year. We saw Quinn Miners the same thing from Wisconsin Whitewater. I mean, he helped himself. He didn't play football for a whole year. He came and played center for the first time at the senior bowl and probably up to stock by a full round, okay? Right. So when when you when you're off, whether it's due to injury, whether your team didn't play, or whether you opted out, John – you got to train. You got to you got to wow the scouts. You got to sit there and say, the last time you saw me, I was putting up what 15, 16 sacks at Miami, and I'm going to put on a show here at my pro day. You can't let Quincy Roche, you know, outperform you on your pro day because right. Roche mm-hmm. is going to go later than 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 Russo. Right, and that's why I would say again with the mediocrity incarnate, Marcus Mosher put up a list of all edge guys with lower than thirty three inch verticals and over seven four three cones. It's a very very bad list of players. We have these numbers for a reason. It sets a precedent. You decide at some point who you want to take an outlier a chance on as an outlier. I talked right. about this with Jason away. It's a production outlier, not a testing outlier. But if he's going to hit in the NFL, he'd be an anomaly. There's not guys that have that are less than ten sacks. In college football, they go on to be great in the NFL right. outside of Denell Hunter. They go on to be first round caliber players outside right. of Denell Hunter. That's the only one. Yep. And so it, it's very difficult to bet on that. But you have to say, is am I willing to take that risk as an outlier? That's what you have to ask yourself, Gregory Rousseau. Right. Is his tape good enough that you're willing to take a risk on him? Drafting him at all, really. And yep. I, it just is not to me. So I would not have him on my draft board. I, I mean, I, I had a fourth round grade in him going into this. I expected right. him to test poorly. He did, and so uh, you know, confirmed there. Uh, basically, <laughs> confirmed my priors. Jalen Phillips, on the other hand, Scott also confirmed my priors, but in a good way. Great testing yep. day for Jalen Phillips. Six five and a half, two sixty. Arms came in over thirty three inches long. Um, he had a thirty six inch vertical at two sixty. He had ten five broad. Both those really good numbers. Then he ran a four five six forty. <laughs> four yep. five six at two hundred sixty pounds. A ridiculously good forty. Had a great 10-yard split as well. Again, 40s, 10-yard splits, pro days. I know he's fast for an edge. That's great. He's explosive for an edge. That's great. I don't know where he compares to everybody else in history that runs the times, you know, because it's a pro day, not a combine. What got me, though, Scott, the three-cone. Those are the really important numbers. For people who don't know, the three-cone is not an important – people used it to rip on DK Metcalf. It doesn't matter for wide receivers. And that's what I tried to tell people in the Metcalf year. Three cone doesn't matter. Think about the movements of a three cone. If you watch the three cone be run, it's all about bend and ability to turn those corners like that. That's yeah. hardly applicable to playing wide receiver. It's obviously right. extremely applicable to playing defensive line, right? You have right. to bend yeah, around blockers three to the pocket. The his, three three, three, his three cone was 701, one of the better times that we've seen, especially when you weight adjusted to his weight. Jalen Phillips. No doubt about so, it. Yeah. 701 and, and a 413 short shuttle. 
Yeah. The, now the three cone that that's that is more important, right? Because that that's that's yeah. the cornering uh, as opposed to the forty yes. yard dash. I mean, the Buccaneers drafted Gaines Adams out of Clemson in the first round. I want to say in two thousand seven, six foot five, two hundred and fifty eight pounds. Um, you know, big big arms, thirty four uh, in in an eighth, and and really wowed people with a four six four time in the forty yard dash, and that was at, at the combine. So that that four six four with the ten yard split of one five eight, you know that that was pretty big. But the seven one seven, it wasn't bad. It wasn't great, but it wasn't bad. Seven one seven, right? And Gaines Adams just just didn't, you know, he, he didn't become that first round splash guy that, that the Bucks wanted. They ended up trading him to Chicago a couple of years mm-hmm. later, uh, where unfortunately he passed away at a, at a very um, you know uh, early age due to premature death. But but um, you know, you you have to have the traits. You can't be the outlier. But at the same time, we've seen the Mike Mamulas, we've seen the, the Gaines Adams, we've seen mm-hmm. the, the guys that the, the test really well. It just doesn't translate. I remember you know, speaking of Kansas State, we talked about Josh Freeman. Jordan Willis uh, right. was was a guy that that tested you know, phenomenally, um, I, but it didn't translate on tape. He right. had he actually had good production, like in terms of of stats. He right. had good measurables, but he didn't have good overall tape. The play to play, the down to down, was not very good. And he went, I think, in the third round to the the Bengals and just had a very nondescript career. He'll, mm-hmm. I, I imagine, be at the league pretty soon. So, the, the workout warriors uh, sometimes the numbers are indicative of what right. they can become in the NFL. Other times, not so much. Yeah, and and what you really look for is it's the rare instance when numbers and tape match up, and both are right. really good. Numbers, tape, and production, I would say, yeah. when they all match up like they did for Jalen Phillips, although it's only one year of tape and production, um, that's the only concerning part, I guess, and then how he got to one year. But when all that matches up, you pretty much know you're going to get a good player unless it's character or medicals. Yeah. Character and medicals are the two things I don't really take into account of my evils. I flag them when my right. actual grades come out. But mm-hmm. I can't know the extent of the medical. I, I can't. Right. I don't have insight into that like teams right. do. I can't know the extent of the character. I don't have insight into that like it's teams not just do. Us, John. That's why on whether it's ESPN or NFL Network, whoever, whether it's McShay or whether it's Mel Kiper, or whatever, when they have their, you get to the third round, it's like you know uh, Mel Kiper's top ten remaining prospects, right? And he's got you know a couple of guys at, at the top of that list in the third round that he had with low first round grades. Well, I, I, I don't know why he's still on the board. Well, it's because the teams know, the media right. doesn't, but the teams know that he flunked a physical or he got a bad medical grade at the combine or there there is some some um, off the field stuff that, that the college kept under wraps and, and, and only let the scouts know, but didn't let the media know. Yep. We, we see that every year. There's a handful of guys that, that, uh, that, that you think, wow, why is this guy still on the board? Well, that's, that's why. Right. It usually is. There's something something along those lines, at least, is why. And so I can't speak to that stuff with Phillips. I know there's stuff out there that teams are going to have to yeah. figure out that part of it. What I can see, tape and testing and production, those are the things that I measure and care about. He is a really, really good prospect. I yeah. don't think there's any ways on the board for the Bucks. And it's almost the flip side, Scott. You want them really bad in Tampa Bay because it'd be an unbelievable value oh. pick if they yeah. got him. But think yeah. about this. If he's still on the board at 32, what does that tell you about the fact yeah. that what did the other 31 teams see? So that's, that's where it right. gets really difficult. To I remember when, when Mark Dominic was jumping up and down because Daquan Bowers was still on the board early in the second round yes. when, when Daquan Bowers was supposed to be a potential right. top five pick. We've talked about this before in the pod. I'm not going to waste a bunch of time, but but uh, there's a reason why he was still there on the second round. Sometimes you, you roll the dice and, and well, you take a chance and it works out, right? Right, other exactly. Time, other times it doesn't, but John, if you want to roll the dice, uh, you got to head over to to Symbol. Okay. Oh, absolutely. If, if you haven't done this yet, folks, check out Symbol. It's the stock market for sports that allows you to trade sports teams like stocks and earn cash payouts when your team wins. Symbol has blended sports and the stock market to offer you a new way to invest in and profit off of your favorite teams. Use your sports knowledge to buy low, sell high, and earn cash payouts when your team wins. Join the 2,000-plus early adopters who have started to invest in their favorite teams. The stock market for sports just a tap away. Create a free account in seconds and start profiting from your sports knowledge. If you sign up at symbol.app, Peter Report, that's backslash Peter Report, you're going to get a $10 deposit bonus when you sign up using the promo code Pewter. So 
uh, a great way of, of playing some fantasy football, kind of blending that with stocks in the stock market, John. Absolutely. No question about it. Symbol is the place to be right now. Uh, C. Gasset 7 asks, so does Greg's production not match his tape to you? I believe he's talking about Rousseau. Yes, that's correct. It's exactly right. So when you watch Rousseau on tape, the concern is, again, he's an edge defender, right? He's, he's 266 right. pounds, which is good, but you're not going to play inside full time at 266 pounds unless you have like unbelievable functional strength and technique, really technique more than anything, technique and mental processing. Exactly. If you have that on the interior you can be all right, you know, even if you just had Pat, but he doesn't have any of that. There, he's not a full-time inside player. So we are evaluating him purely as an edge defender right now. And as an edge defender, his body, you need certain traits to be able to succeed. And then you need to win with those traits on the edge on tape. He doesn't do it. I mean, Miami had to scheme production for him. Half his sacks are off inside twists and, and unblocked pass to the quarterback. Um, it's very obvious and easy to see on tape where he's beating guards or he's crossing the face of guards and winning with his length. There might be a role for him in the NFL. I would like to have him on my team in the NFL if the character checks out. I just don't want to draft him in the first round or even in the second round. I just don't. I, you know, again, I, again, then after the athletic testing, you know, I probably would just wait on him and somebody else is going to draft him higher than I would. So in that, when you take that context, I just wouldn't probably have him on my board in that regard. And so, yeah, his production does not match his tape. A lot of that production is well. First of all, I think six five or six sacks came against Florida state. I don't know if you even count their offensive line is real, but right. and then he had that kind of production. He piled up against weaker competition. And then um, you watch the tape and it's very obvious. That's why it's befuddling to me. And I have all the respect for Daniel Jeremiah and a lot of those people, but it's crazy to me that he is ranked as highly for those people. I mean, we knew this was going to be the case going into today and they got surprised by it. But I thought it obvious. And I know I wasn't alone in thinking that it was obvious based on his tape that uh, just wasn't wasn't there athletically where he needed to be uh, to be a great edge in the NFL. Yeah. So uh, it's a big day to determine the board and to set some things up. I think Russo could be a player that falls. Hopefully the Bucks yeah. go pay attention to those testing numbers and, and adhere to that and pass. Um, yeah. Phillips could be a player that that rises, but it's again it's going to be character and medicals. It's going to be where his draft stocks ultimately decided. And, it, and it, the thing with Russo is, is only one year of, of productivity, right? Yeah. And, and you know, we mentioned Daquan Bowers a couple minutes ago. John, in 2009, his sophomore season, Daquan Bowers had 10 and a half tackles for loss and only three sacks. That was it, three. The next year, as a junior, he was ACC Defensive Player of the Year, first team All-American, 26 tackles for loss, 15 and a half sacks. So he had one Boom, blow up year mm -hmm. at Clemson, and and that prompted him to leave Clemson early. And there, but until he had that microfracture knee surgery, he was thought to be a top ten pick, maybe the, right. the first pick overall. As it turns out, he was a one year wonder at Clemson. That production never materialized in the NFL, and so you have to wonder about guys like Rousseau with just one year worth of productivity. You know, it's it's hard to make it's hard it's hard to to write down in pen rather than pencil that this guy is going to be, you know, an right. NFL starter and a productive one. Right. Absolutely. Uh, one question here before we wrap things up, Jeremy, a $5 super chat. We greatly appreciate that. Jeremy, John, I got a hold fever on, in the, hold on. I got this, John, I got this. Oh. I got a fever. And the only prescription is your draft knowledge on my Syracuse <laughs> orange secondary players. Love Cisco who was pro projected as a first round pick. Tell us about that safety. Yeah, so I haven't actually scouted Cisco yet because safeties are probably last on my radar this year just because the Bucs have – I mean, it's be very unlikely that they drafted one. So I'll take a longer look at him closer to the draft probably. I'm, I'm definitely in cram uh, mode right now and trying to get as many of these guys evaluated as I can. Yeah. Uh, but I will say I've seen Malafonwu, and I really like Malafonwu. Um, I think that he's really good potential. It's probably going to come down to like the same thing it did with his brother, like physicality, yeah. commitment to the game, you know, those kinds of things for Malafonwu. Very talented. I thought he had a really good senior bowl week. Right. Um, so I'm a yeah. fan of him for sure. Cisco, I'll have to take a closer look at. I know he's pretty polarizing. Well, well yeah, and, but a big-time ball hawk. I mean, he, yes, had, he had the picks. <laughs> seven interceptions as a freshman, nine pass breakups, five picks as a, a sophomore with, uh, with five interceptions, five pass breakups. Only played in two games last year, but he had mm -hmm. one interception, so you add them all up, 13 picks. Don't see that very often. Now, no, is it a Gerard Holliman thing or what's going on? You know, remember he had like yeah. 14 picks in his last year in college yeah. and then was a seventh rounder yep. to the Steelers. And frankly, had seventh round tape despite having like a ridiculous amount of picks. So it was a very, I uh, will have to see if it's like that with Cisco, but it's always weird when a guy's that many 
turnover, you know, he's not really talked about yeah. as a top 100 pick. You have to go to the tape and see kind of if people are missing out or not. But we do got sleepers on this podcast, and we will get to them in future episodes this week. Scott and I have a couple guys we've been talking about that right. people out there are not talking about that could be Bucks targets. I wrote an article today over at PeterReport.com on four guys that could be Bucks first round picks. It depends how things go and obviously how the draft unfolds. It could be Bucks first round pick. It would be a little bit of a surprise to people. It's the best player available situation for the Bucks. So there's some names to throw out there that we haven't talked about before. We've got a we can cast a wide net right on this podcast yes. now. Everybody's back for the Bucks. We've got a lot to talk about in terms of different types of player, different positions, different players that could be available that this team could select in the first round. It's going to be a fun month until the draft, Scott. Uh, it's going to it be is. a great time on the Pew Report podcast. So we'll have guests, too, that will be joining us, give us more and more insight into these prospects as well. So tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to be back on the podcast 4 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be a great time. We appreciate all you jumping in with us right here for another edition of the Pewter Report podcast.